Hello and welcome to Back to the Science. I'm Dr. Susan Oliver and I'm a scientist and this is Julie Oliver and she's a dog. Booster doses for COVID have been in the news quite a bit lately and predictably anti-vaxxers are attempting to use them as proof of vaccine failure. This is of course nonsense and ignores the fact that a number of vaccines require multiple doses. But why are booster or third doses sometimes necessary? Let's go back to the science and have a look. There are a number of studies now showing that there is some waning against infection over time in people who have been vaccinated against COVID. I won't bore you with all of them, but this study, which was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, shows the general trend. The data comes from Israel where they are exclusively using the Pfizer vaccine, but similar results are being seen in other countries and with other vaccines. So let's have a look at the results. This figure shows the rate of infections by age, depending on how long ago the vaccine was received. As you can see, as the time since the second dose gets longer, the rate of infection increases. And this is the same for all age groups. An important caveat though is for the younger age groups, the people who got the vaccine earlier will be either people with compromised immune systems or healthcare workers. And you would expect higher rates of infection amongst these groups anyway. Those with compromised immune systems aren't able to mount as good a, a response to vaccines as others and healthcare workers have both a greater exposure rate and a greater testing rate. Now, if you don't understand the science, you may look at this data and assume that vaccines are failing, but that is actually not the case because infections only tell half the story. We also need to look at serious disease. This data is from the same study, but instead of looking at just infections, they homed in on serious disease. Now, it's important to know that this figure has a different scale than the previous one, so the overall numbers are much, much lower. What we can see, though, is that if you are under 60 years of age, there is no waning in protection against serious disease over time. However, if you are over 60, there appears to be some waning. And we know that people over 60 are more likely to suffer from what is known as immunosenescence, which means they are less able to develop long-term immunity. The important thing to note is that there is nothing unusual about this data, and it is what most scientists expected. Indeed, it is quite common for vaccines to be multi-dose. Just one example is the hepatitis B vaccine, which is a three-dose schedule with the third dose typically given six months after the first dose. So why are multi-dose vaccines often necessary? To understand, we first need to look at the components of the adaptive immune system that are produced in response to immunisation and also in response to infection. The first component is antibodies, and this is probably the component you've heard the most about. Antibodies recognise specific proteins known as antigens on viruses and essentially grab onto them. This then prevents the virus from entering cells and replicating. The next component is memory B cells. These are essentially antibody making factories that are ready to be switched on as soon as an antigen is detected again. The body also produces two types of T cells, which also play important roles in fighting infections. One type is known as CD8 cells, but have the much more catchy name of cytotoxic or killer T cells. These cells recognise the specific antigens on the surface of cells that have been infected by the virus and proceed to essentially destroy the infected cell. This stops the virus spreading to more cells. The other type are known as CD4 cells or helper T cells. And these cells do just what their name suggests. Once they recognise an antigen, they start helping other components of the immune system to respond. Now, all of these components play a role in preventing serious disease, but in terms of preventing any infection, antibodies play a greater role than the other components. And the reason for this is because the antibodies are already there, ready for action as soon as the virus enters the body, whereas the other components are activated once the antigen is recognised. This means that as antibodies wane over time, you will still be protected against serious disease from B cells and T cells, but you'll be less protected against infection. So why doesn't the body just maintain high levels of antibodies and prevent infection? Well, basically it takes a lot of calories to build and maintain antibody levels, which in my opinion is another great reason to get vaccinated because you get to burn more calories for a while. 
but the body rather annoyingly likes to conserve calories. This means that over time antibody levels will decline and will eventually be maintained at a lower level. However, the antibody level that is maintained will be dependent on what type of threat the body perceives the invader to be. If the body's immune system only sees a virus once or twice and then never again, it will determine that there is no need to maintain high levels of antibodies. However, if the body sees the same antigen six months later, it is likely to perceive there is a greater threat and maintain a higher antibody level for longer. So will this happen after a third dose of a COVID vaccine? The simple answer is we don't know and we won't know for quite a while, but there is some cause for hope. This figure is part of the data that has been provided to various regulatory authorities around the world as part of Pfizer's application for a booster dose. And it's also been submitted to a journal for publication. The figure compares neutralising antibody levels one month after the second dose with levels one month after the third dose for both the wild type and Delta variant of SARS-CoV-2. I would have preferred to see a larger sample size as well as some measurement of T cells, but it is what it is. Importantly though, the neutralising antibodies after the third dose are substantially higher than after the second dose. Now this isn't immediately apparent if you just glance at the figure, but the y-axis is a log scale which means each tick mark is 10 times the value of the tick mark below it. So for the Delta variant, antibody levels are over 5 times higher for the 18 to 55 age group and over 12 times higher for the 65 to 85 age group, which is great. But as someone who is in the 55 to 65 age group, I'm feeling a little left out at the moment. Mm. Now, you'd expect with these higher levels of antibodies as a starting point, somewhat higher levels will be maintained long term. But we can't say that for sure until we have the data. Increasing antibody levels look promising, but what about those over 60 or other people with compromised immune systems who may get waning of protection against serious disease? Will the booster help them? This study was published in the New England Journal of Medicine and looked at the effectiveness of a booster dose at least five months after the second dose for people in Israel. And this is what they found. There was an 11-fold reduction in confirmed infections in the boosted population and a 19-fold reduction in severe infections. And the booster group was defined as those who had received the booster dose at least 12 days ago. Pfizer have also completed a randomised trial that showed a relative vaccine efficacy of 95.6% across all ages for the boosted group versus the non-boosted group. However, so far, they've only released the information via press release, so there's very little detail available. So we know that waning in protection against infection over time is expected, and we also know that a booster dose will restore that protection against infection, as well as restore protection against serious disease for those who are immunocompromised. What we don't know is how long protection in boosted people will last, and we can't know until more time has passed. But we do know that generally protection lasts longer after a third dose than a second dose. So if you're fairly young and healthy, should you get a booster dose if you're eligible? Well, I think the answer to that question depends on why you chose to be vaccinated in the first place. Some people argue that since vaccines still protect against serious disease for most people, there is no reason to get a booster. And it is definitely true that if COVID didn't cause serious disease, there wouldn't have been a vaccine developed. But protection against serious disease is not the only reason that people get vaccinated. A lot of people also just don't want to get sick with COVID. Now, some scientists argue that this doesn't matter, but most of them will still get paid if they get sick with COVID. And not everyone is that lucky. Of course, the other reason to get vaccinated is to protect people more vulnerable than yourself and just generally stop the spread of COVID. Now, we do know that even if you get infected with SARS-CoV-2 following vaccination, you are less likely to, to transmit to others than if you haven't been vaccinated. But clearly, if you don't get infected in the first place, you can't transmit at all. And I will be doing a video on the evidence why vaccinated people are less likely to transmit. So please hit the subscribe button if you'd like to see it. For me personally, protecting other people is just as important as protecting myself, so I'll be getting a booster dose as soon as I'm eligible, which will be February next year. 
My first two doses were AstraZeneca, which is an adenovirus, and unless new evidence emerges, I'll be getting one of the mRNA vaccines as my third dose. The reason for this is that there is some evidence suggesting that mixing an adenovirus vaccine with an mRNA vaccine provides the best protection. This study was published in Nature and they compared two doses of Pfizer, which is an mRNA vaccine, with a dose of AstraZeneca followed by a dose of Pfizer. And this is what they found. Basically, the AstraZeneca dose followed by a Pfizer dose provided better protection against infection than two doses of Pfizer vaccine. And the difference was statistically significant. And the reason they believe for the difference is that the Pfizer vaccine provides a better antibody response but the AstraZeneca vaccine provides a better T cell response. So together you get a synergistic effect which provides better immunity. We don't have the data, but it seems likely that you would get similar results if you mixed and matched other adenovirus vaccines like J&J &J with other mRNA vaccines like Moderna. Now, if you'd like to read the papers that I discussed yourselves, you'll find a link to them in the video's description. And please remember, this video is about the science, but you shouldn't take it as medical advice. For that, you should speak to your medical practitioner. So thank you for listening. And if you'd like to see more videos in the future, please hit the subscribe button.